Friuli Venezia Giulia is Italy's northern easternmost region. It borders with Slovenia to the east, with Austria to the north, with Italy to the west, and with the Adriatic Sea to the south. The location of this region is significant as it has historically represented a strategic point for cultures, peoples, and armies to cross their paths. Within the European context, this region plays a crucial role. It was where World War I was fought, where important people met, where powers contended the area for the political purposes, and it represents the history of different people and culture coming together to constitute this region. It was unified in 1954, with Trieste being the last territory annexed. We begin our journey on the 25th of April, also known as Liberation Day. This day marks the anniversary of the end of the fascist regime in the country, which was followed by the end of the Nazi occupation in the northern territory of the country in the days that followed. We're here in Palma Nova during the celebration. This small town is also known as a fortress city, given its purpose as a military point. Starting from the Venetian occupation between 1593 and 1797, to the Italian one starting in 1866, to the presence of Napoleon and then of the Austrians, this city contains a lot of history. During World War I, Palma Nova was an area behind the battlefield until 1917. In other words, a zone that was not directly involved in combat operations, but served as a basis to support operations along the front line. Palmanova also hosts the Austrian Garen Cemetery, which is one of the main war cemeteries in Friuli Venezia Giulia and accommodates the remains of over 17,000 soldiers, most of them from the areas around Gorizia. The reason why the city hosts the Austrian Garen Cemetery follows the defeat of Caporetto. The front line and areas behind the battlefields were heavily affected by the rapid descent of Austro German forces. The civilian population in Friuli and in Easter Veneto had to adapt to a new occupation that was in some respects even harsher in view of the desperate situation of the Habsburg army. These events have characterized the region country and they represent an important milestone for the creation of the Friuli Venezia Trulia. So let's now move to the events of the front line. The 26th of April 1915, the Kingdom of Italy agreed to the Treaty of London together with the United Kingdom. France and Russia, with which an alliance was created for the First World War. Italy's participation in the war was characterized by a mixture of national aspirations and an objective of power politics. The Italian front was almost 600 kilometers from Stelvio to the Adriatic Sea. At the east, it ran along the river Isonzo and ended at sea. This was the most important area of action during the war, the stage of a bloody war of position. We're here in Sagrado, and behind me you can see the river Isonzo. The majority of Italian soldiers fought the war close to the Eastern Territory and specifically on the Carso, in the trenches on Mount San Michele, on the Sabotino and Mount San Martino, and because of this it became an important place for the memory of the country. Twelve battles were fought here in total. This was a strategic territory as it would allow both parts easy access to the enemy's territory without having to pass through the Alps. Come with me and let's discover all of these sites. The summit of the mountain, which was the main Austro-Hungarian defensive bastion on the Isonzo Karst, fiercely disputed between the armies since the first year of the war, has been recognized as a monumental zone. The first two years of the First World War were fought harshly here. The battles around the mountain started the 3rd of July 1915, but it was not only until the second battle of the Isonzo, 
from the 18th of July until the 3rd of August that the top of the mountain was reached. In this battle, the Italians suffered the loss of around 46,000 soldiers, whereas the Austrian troops around 10,000. This was the beginning of the war on the Italian territory. From 1922, San Michele was declared a sacred place, and in 1935, a museum was created to remember the war. On this mountain, many known people fought, one of these being the poet Giuseppe Ungaretti, who also wrote a very famous poem about a small village, San Martino del Carso, which in 1915 was at the core of the front line and was completely destroyed by bombing. During spring, small progress had been achieved on Angorizia, on Mount Sabotino, and on Mount San Michele. On this last hill, after the 5th Battle of the Isonzo, the soldiers of the 9th Army Corps had successfully advanced up to a few meters of the front line of the Austro-Hungarian troops, building new trenches and safe encampments for missile launches. But it was exactly in this zone on Isonzo cars that the soldiers led by Porojevic made an experiment by means of an attack using one of the many technological innovations of the Great War, chemical bombs. Indeed. Mount San Michele is also known because, on the 29th of June 1916, the first chemical attack occurred, killing around 3,000 people. This is the entrance gate of the Schönbrück Tunnel, one of the main defensive structures built by the Austro-Hungarian army. The tunnel cuts across the whole mound and reaches the opposite side. It was used as a shelter and also as a passageway for the Austro-Hungarian reserves heading to the front line. Here there are numerous historical findings and monuments while walking along the trail, which include trenches and also a cave used as a recovery spot by the Austrian forces. The area where the battles were fought is the Trincea delle Frasche. This area is dotted with passageways, trenches, fortifications and structures built by both Italian and Austro-Hungarian armies. Among these, the Trincea delle Frasche used to be one of the hardest obstacles for the Italian soldiers during their first assaults. Excavated by the Habsburg army in the early stages of war, it was only lost at the end of 1915. Its name comes from the clever camouflaging device by the Hungarian soldiers, who would cover it with tree branches to avoid recognition by observers and airplanes. In this area, we can also find monuments and graveyards commemorating the soldiers that died during the war. In August 1916, began the Battle of Corizza, which led to the conquest of the city and of Mount San Michele on the 8th of August. Italian troops were advancing and were winning the offensives, but at this point, the Germans sent extra troops, which resulted in a defeat of Caporetto. This became of symbolic value, and after the breakthrough of Caporetto, the Austrian-German troops reached an extensive part of Fiori, including Udina. These territories suffered an occupation which interest the last year of the war. In Gorizia, we also find the Austria of Oslavia, which was built on Mount Calvario in 1938. The monument was created by the fascist regime to accommodate the remains of the soldiers who fell in different battles fought around Gorizia and Tolmin, which is now part of Slovenia, during the Great War. A similar concept was used to build a Sacrario di Redipuglia, which represents the biggest graveyard of World War I. However, this was not the original burial site. The previous commemoration site in the area was the Cimitero degli Inviti della Terza Armata. The remnants of the soldiers buried here were later moved to the Sacrario di Redipuglia once it was fully built. During fascism, the myth of the Great War was exploited. Mussolini went to visit the site to be used for the Sacrario in 1923, and in this period, the Great War was defined in the fascist religious collective imaginary as a myth of resurrection of the new Italy, consecrated by the blood of the fallen. The Sacrario has the remnants of around 40,000 identified people who died during the Great War and 60,000 remnants from those who were unfortunately not identified. 
The pathway that leads to the Sacrario has the names of all of the battles fought in the area, reinforcing the importance of remembering how the frontier was established after the war. The tomb of the Duca d'Aosta occupies the central space before the massive staircase, buried together with the third battalion of which he was the commander. This tomb has engraved on it the word presente, which is meant to symbolize both the presence but also the fascist recall of names. Let's now discover this side of history. Welcome to Trieste. Mainly Italian, the city and the surrounding area have always presented populations of Slavic origins. The city has been an important one for many aspects. It was the main port of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and a cultural center for all of Europe. So let's see. Here you can see Piazza del Unità, called like this to celebrate the annexation of the city to the Kingdom of Italy on the 4th of November 1918, after the end of the Great War. Opposite the square, Audace Pier produces on the Gulf of Trieste and is an ideal spot for a stroll along the waterfront. Built in the mid-70s, it was originally dedicated to St. Charles. But on the 3rd of November 1918, when the war was over, the Italian destroyer Adace moored at this pier, so it was renamed Adace. Finally, you can observe two sculptures by artist Fiorenzo Bacci on the waterfront dedicated to the soldiers who fell for Trieste. Both statues were installed in 2004 for the 50th anniversary of the return of Trieste to Italy. On the way to Trieste, you can make a stop to admire the Victory Lighthouse. It was designed right after World War I for two reasons. To illuminate the Gulf of Trieste and celebrate the annexation of the city to the Kingdom of Italy. Located right in the heart of Trieste, the Memory Park, has been located on the slopes of the Colle de San Giusto. In the middle of the green area crossed by Via Capitolina, the road leading to the hilltop, you can walk through this area dotted by a number of memorial stones bearing the names of all Trieste native soldiers who fell in the war. Several memory parks were created in Italy during the early years of the fascist regime. At the end of the memory park, right before the square of the top of Colle di San Giusto, you can admire a large statue for honoring the soldiers who fell in World War II, the Monument of the Fallen Soldiers of Trieste. It was inaugurated before King Victor Emmanuel III and numerous high-ranking fascist officials in 1935. The monument represents five men engaging in a dramatic war scene, three of them holding one injured whether the fifth protects the rest with a shield. On the base, it is engraved the de dedication Trieste to the Fallen in the Liberation War, 1915 until 1918, in which the Liberation War does not refer to the resistance of the Second World War, but the concept of an Italian Trieste liberated from Austria Hungary in an idea fascist patriotic nationalism. In 1936, with the approaching of Germany questioned the Italian hold on Venezia Giulia, especially as Trieste represented a strategic point for its port. In 1939, the eastern frontier started playing a strategic role. Italy's participation next to Germany in the Second World War extended these views and it seems that the Venezia Giulia could be destined to become an oriental gate to gain access to the Slavic territories in the south, to Greece and to Albania. The Venezia Giulia, together with Trieste, remained a contested space by Italians, Yugoslavs and Germans. After the 8th of September 1943, the date that marks the dissociation of the Italian monarchy from Germany, Venezia Giulia effectively chases to be part of the Italian state and becomes a territory directly administrated by the Reich. In this way, the establishment of the Adriatic coast, including the provinces of Udine, Trieste, Gorizia, Pola, Rijeka and Ljubljana, sanctioned the de facto annexation to Germany. 
Let's now move to the last years of the war and the events that led to the creation of the region as we know it today. And it was in that period with the partisan struggle that the town of Faedis began to play a leading role in the unfolding of the war. In Friuli, given the chaos that followed the signing of the armistice, the mountains of central and the eastern pre-Alps witnessed the formation of the first partisan units which were born to fight the Nazi fascists. In questa situazione nascono subito dei movimenti partigiani che si promettono di combattere l'invasore nazista e il fascismo che continua a collaborarci. La prima formazione partigiana è la Brigata Proletaria e nasce per opera degli operai dei cantieri navali di Monfalcone ed opera soprattutto nel Collio. Altrove il movimento resistenziale friulano è soprattutto animato da queste due anime che hanno animato gran parte della resistenza italiana. Il movimento comunista e socialista crea le formazioni Garibaldi che hanno l'impatto più potente dal punto di vista sia politico che effettivamente di azioni militari. E l'altra parte del movimento partigiano è invece comandato dalle Brigate Verdi, che sono, le part- sono i partigiani cattolici che vengono riuniti nella Brigata Usocco. Qui ci troviamo a Palmanova, dove nella caserma Piave che abbiamo appena visitato c'è stato quello che forse era uno dei punti più tragici dell'epopea partigiana. Qui infatti c'era un centro di antirepressione in cui i tedeschi e i fascisti hanno massacrato centinaia di persone su 500 o più che sono passate tra queste celle. Questo centinaio di persone veniva torturato, sono morti per tortura, morti addirittura incendiati a volte per quasi per un gioco dei loro aguzzini. Ed è stato qua che il, il movimento partigiano ha affrontato delle prove terribili. Nei primi giorni di maggio del 1945 questa caserma cessa di essere il luogo di tortura e di morte perché avviene la liberazione. Molti di coloro che si resero partecipi di questi crimini non pagarono mai le conseguenze dei loro atti. Di certo il primo comandante della caserma, Borsotti, venne giustiziato a seguito di un processo del Tribunale del Popolo nei giorni successivi alla fine della guerra. E mentre altre figure di spicco vennero ammistiate. of the Second World War, the problem of defining the borders between Yugoslavia and Italy arose, which also concerned the eastern part of Friuli. On February 10, 1947, the Treaty of Paris was signed between Italy and the Allied powers. This established the free territory of Trieste. The situation was clarified only on the 5th of October of 1954, when the London Memorandum of city of Trieste in its international free port was passed from the Allied military administration to the Italian civil administration. With the constitutional law of January 31, 1963, which came into force on February 16, the Friuli Venezia Giulia region was then formed, of which Trieste became its capital. <laughs> 